Good morning, everyone. Hope you can hear me okay. I'm going to start by trying some Latvian, and then you can laugh, and then we'll move on in English if that's okay. So, Svaki um, and Labret, Labrit, is that right? Hello and good morning. Okay, great. Um, I, I do have someone in Latvian uh, who is Latvian in my team over in the UK. Um, she was really excited to hear we were coming here today, um, and you'll see a bit of Latvian here and there, thanks to her, um, not due to my Google ability. Um, so first, let me just tell you a little bit about myself, and then we'll move on and hear a bit about the organisation. Um, okay, so um, when I grow up, I want to work in a soap factory. It's a matter of fact that these words most certainly never came out of my mouth. I had no idea of my career aims, and I didn't take the time for almost a decade after I left school to actually stop and consider what I really wanted to do with my time. I took pride in my work and had lots of passion for life, but it wasn't until 2012 that I began to connect these with purpose at work and in life. My first career was in consultancy. I worked for some interesting com companies, including Disney, um, I worked at Accenture, Vodafone, um, in the banking sector and in the en en energy sector. Um, and I was doing analytics, cost reduction strategies, and I was really good at saving corporations millions of pounds. Um, didn't make me particularly proud of my job, but I was, it's good to be good at your work, right? Um, I cared less about earning lots of money, and I certainly didn't care about nice handbags and shoes. Um, but uh, I really enjoyed the competition element and working in um, an environment that was fast-paced. Um, I found my work overall fairly unfulfilling, and I know many of my colleagues felt equally dissatisfied. Um, two years ago, I got promoted at Accenture, and I decided straight away, before I got used to the increased salary, to escape um, and do something else with my career. So I realigned from a purpose of competition to a purpose of collaboration, where if I win, society and the people around me also win. I'm now the head of commercial and responsible for a big chunk of our three million pound revenue, ensuring this grows, and as it grows, we will help more people. Um, as a bit of personal background, we're going to hear a little bit about disability today. Um, I have a few disabled family members and have worked in the disability industry um, or charity sector in India. Um, and certainly there are some personal motivations behind my movement into social enterprise and disability. Um, but many of my colleagues have no background in that way and have still decided to move and realign their life towards social enterprise. So you don't really need that personal bit. Um, and uh, I know that many people have short attention spans and um, many of our generation love playing videos. So I'm going to start us off with a video to give you an overview of the organization um, and then we will sink a bit into the detail. Making soap and creating opportunities. Bottle after bottle, label after label, box after box. For many here, an ordinary job has made an extraordinary difference. It's not an average workplace, you know. I've, you, you've, I've felt love and I felt like, like I was in a family environment. I, I'd, I'd like to stay here for as long as I can. So, I'm, I'm really, yeah, I, I, need, I need this place because I, I would be lost. Hello, Jasmine. Ricky brings his guide dog to work, but aside from her cage, the factory isn't adapted for its staff. The difference, they say, is in their attitudes towards disability. And it's been the same since 1854 when the company was set up by a blind teenager who knew that she and others would struggle to find work. 160 years on and still three quarters of blind or partially sighted people aren't in work. A lot of people that join Clarity of, uh, and, and the Soap Co haven't worked for a long time, if ever. And it's really just giving that, those people the opportunity to prove themselves that, that we can do. And that, in, that builds people's confidence, builds people's skills, and sort of proves to the next employer that this person can do a job. For more than 160 years, this social enterprise has been providing job opportunities for blind and disabled people across London. They now hope that a new brand will mean more sales and more job opportunities. The Soap Co launched a year ago, creating 40 jobs, including Ron's. He's 48. This is the first job he's ever had. I'm on medication for epilepsy. Yeah. Yeah. 
So did you find it difficult to find work then? For yeah, this really, really, yeah, because I was worse than I am now. Yeah. But now I'm getting much better than I was, yeah. Do you think that's because of working? Well, maybe, I, I couldn't tell, because all I used to do before was just sit in the house and do nothing, then. So most times I say yes. Profits from the sales go to creating more jobs and in turn more hope and confidence to those who work here. Katie Oakes, ITV News. So. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, great. Well, I didn't make the video, but they did a great job. They came into the factory and they were around filming for about three hours. Then they had two hours back um, editing it, and it was on the 6 o'clock news, so the same day, and I was just blown away by their professionalism and ability to really grasp the, um, the story um, and convey it very well. So um, it, was a, it was a very good learning experience for us as well. Um, so you've heard a little bit about the organization there. Um, let's just go through what we'll cover today. Shall I click it again? Yeah, good. All right, great. So, um, firstly, we will go through the, the history. Um, seems to be a little bit delay on the clicker, but we'll... Okay, right, great. So, um, first we'll go through the history. Um, there's a lot of history, as you might have picked up, but we'll, we'll see a bit of it in a minute. We'll then talk about the UK social enterprise ecosystem. Um, we'll move on to talking about social value, and our social value in particular and then the plan and what we're doing and looking at going forward. Um, the main point I guess I want to get across as a social entrepreneur is the importance of balancing um, the third and fourth ones. So we really need to have a grasp on social value and constantly be having one eye on social value and one eye on finances. Um, and they both have to work. Um, if you focus on one and you really care about social but you don't have a very good business plan, you'll definitely fail, um, sorry, um, it will happen. Um, maybe you'll be supported with grants and things for a few years, but if you really want to last in the long term, you have to have the eye on both. So uh, if you want to focus on one, then hire someone else that's got their eye on the other one, and together you'll, you'll make it work. So, um, and, and my second point, I guess, is that you don't need 160 years of history, which we're about to start talking about, to do what we're doing. Um, in many ways, what we're doing now would be much easier if we didn't have 160 years of history. Um, and we can talk a little bit about some of those challenges as well. So, our history. Um, we were founded in 1854, um, and we started off with a very long name, and we've changed names a few times um, over the years. Um, Elizabeth Gilbert was our... Um, our founder, um, and she was a teenager at the time, came from a wealthy background, and at the age of three she contracted scarlet fever and went blind. Um, and I guess she really didn't want to sit around all day and not do anything useful, so she was the one that, that opened it up. So our founder, Miss Elizabeth Gilbert, um, a pretty wonderful lady, um, and uh, she really believed in enabling people with visual impairments to help themselves and to earn their own living and that same mission as a charity has been completely unchanged since 1854. So Elizabeth set up the first workshop in Hoban, which is right in central London, on the central line, if anyone knows it well. Um, and the first employees, there were seven of them, and employed um, to make baskets, so lots of basket weaving. Um, the concept was to train people to make quality products, and the proceeds of those sales would be reinvested in the business, um, which would mean that it would qualify as a social enterprise all the way back then, before we even started thinking about legal definitions. Um, We'll move on. So, this is the history. There's a lot of it. Um, we won't go into the detail, but if you can um, look at the bigger version, maybe when you get the materials later, um, it, it draws your attention to what was happening back here. So, Charles Darwin and the origin of species being written pretty much after we started, so it really puts it all into perspective. But even more interesting maybe for you guys, and with the help of my Latvian colleague, um, is to put a few Latvian timelines next to it. So um, famous, famous politicians and publicists, um, please don't make me pronounce the name, but that was the, the notable um, event of that year. Correct me if you can think of anything else. Um, and then as we continue onwards, um, some famous poets were born, um, opening of a chocolate factory. I personally love cheese, chocolate, and wine, so that had to come on here. Um, 
and then into the, into the 1918 sort of period. It's a very difficult period for us as a charity, uh, which you'll hear about a little bit later. Um, uh, some, some other ones about clocks being built and certain famous enterprises opening up. Um, we had the first European basketball championship, which I hear that Latvian won, uh, Latvians won, is that right? Um, so congratulations on that, not that I follow basketball particularly. Um, and a notable one, maybe on the next click. Um, yeah, so ration tokens of soap were introduced in 1989. So it's, it's a really interesting one that I saw. And the, and the last one's there. Oh, a few. Okay, yeah. And um, some, a, a famous soap shop, Stenders, started, um, opened their first shop selling soap. So I'd love to meet them while I'm over here, but maybe that doesn't work. Um, right, we will, we'll move on. Oh, one thing I did miss is 1981 there, you'll see my colleague Aveta was born, so she put her own uh, birth up there. Um, <laughs> so, um, hopefully that brought a little bit of historical perspective for you guys as we go through the next few slides of history. Um, the first photo there is, is Queen Victoria. She was our first patron. So all the way back in 18, I think it was the late 1850s, she donated 50 pounds, which is the equivalent of around 5,000 pounds of today's money. Um, and that provided the, the finances to open the first factory. Um, we had other supporters, including Prime Minister Gladstone, the Archbishop of York, and Charles Dickens. Um, so very famous writer, obviously, and he, he wrote an article called At Work in the Dark, and the proceeds of that went to the charity as well. And it's great to try and read the bad PDF of um, what came out all those years ago. Um, so certainly forward thinking, you might have seen this picture in the, in the video, but if you can read some of the text, um, not the best marketing ploy, perhaps having so many words on one sign, um, but this was their approach back then. So really shout about it. Um, if you give us work by giving us orders, we can employ people. And this is really maybe one of the earliest mentions of social enterprise, certainly in the UK. We do pride ourselves as being the oldest social enterprise in the UK. And I would love for someone to come and disagree with us and say that they were earlier. But um, lots of those organizations, I guess, aren't surviving or they've maybe changed into a profit-making organization like famous chocolate companies like Cadbury's. They used to be social enterprises, but certainly wouldn't be considered that way anymore. Um, let me just check where I am, sorry. Um, so the, the workshop grew and we employed more and more people and in 1980, um, 1893 we moved to bigger premises on Tottenham Court Road, um, which again, right slap bang in the middle of central London. Um, but really the point of this slide is you know, how forward thinking the organization was back then and the distinction straight away between trade and donation. So, um, Later on in the 20th century, oh, we, we sort of expanded what we were doing. Um, we had some new patrons of the Prince of Wales, um, Queen Alexandra, King Edward VII, um, and charity presidents included the Archbishop of Canterbury. Um, in 1901, we expanded from baskets into mats, um, and we even provided mats for a famous um, boat that toured the world with um, the Duke and Duchess of York. Um, we survived some turbulent times through 1900 and, and through the war, and we stayed open. Um, and 1918, we had record sales figures of 21,000 pounds, which back then, I guess, was quite a lot of money. Um, more people were employed after 1918, and we continued to grow and produce baskets, brushes, uh, brooms, upholstery, uh, chair seats, divans, and mattresses. Um, and sales ledgers, I haven't seen them myself, self, but we've been told that um, we even made a mattress for Madonna back in the day. So there's some famous names in there and other names that you probably wouldn't have heard of, like Tim Henman and Paul Gascoigne and others. Um, so the next part is our, our movement to soap. Um, so with some grants in 1936, um, we, we moved to start producing soap. And Winston Churchill, um, a prime minister from many years ago, became a regular donor to what was then called the general welfare of the blind. Um, soap was probably a good move because I doubt there's anyone in this room that doesn't use soap. Um, it provides a good business model. So um, choose something that everyone uses. If you want to create a niche product that only 0.1% of 
um, the country uses, then you're going to have a harder marketing job. Um, so good decision back in 1936 for us to move into soap production. Um, and the next big decision was to start up door-to-door -door sales. So knocking on people's doors and, and trying to sell the products that way. And that's really a community feel of, of getting out there and talking to people and explaining the social mission. And uh, it's often the best way to do that is face-to-face -face with people. And people get it. People understand what we're all about. We just need sort of 30 seconds to talk to people about it. Um, so door-to-door -door sales became huge for about 50 years for us into the mid-80s. Door-to-door um, -door sales was incredibly important. And we expanded from soap into shampoo, foam baths, shower gels, um, body lotions, and car cleaning kits. And my goodness, we've got probably 200 products now, far too many, and there's other challenges involved, obviously, in having too many. Um, but door-to-door -door -door sales worked well, and um, one rep in one week took 20,000 pounds of sales. Just one person, door-to-door. -door. So it was a really profitable model. Um, Sadly, um, in the 90s, we were told that we as a charity couldn't collect donations and sell products at the same time. And uh, it went to the High Court in the UK, um, a bit of a shame, but we were then no longer allowed to sell door to door. Um, so a bit of environmental change, and in um, 1995, we opened up a telesales operation instead. So no more knocking on the doors, and we moved over to the telephones, which was, again, a good decision back in 1995. There was a huge availability of data, um, and uh, let me just click onwards. They were some of the catalogues when we went door to door. Lovely old photos, nice outfits. Um, and, and recently, here are some celebrities that you probably won't know either because they're British, but um, uh, Joanna Lumley and others. Um, Stephen Fry is a, a very famous sort of comedian um, and writer uh, in the UK. But, you know, we've, we've done a good job in the past of getting celebrities, and then because our staff have changed, we've lost the connections and have no contact with any of them anymore. So every time we have to build it up again, and there are risks and, and challenges within the social enterprise scene. Um, so on the telephone data side, we quickly grew to having 250,000 customers across the UK. Um, through telesales, really easy to get people's phone numbers, give them a call, or, or introduce ourselves at, at certain events. And then we have a really good pipeline of sales. Worked really well until uh, the telephone preferencing service in the UK removed people's phone numbers from, from the book. Um, and now most people don't have their phone number publicly available, um, which means telesales uh, pipeline uh, dries up. There's, there's not really an opportunity to find new customers. Um, so it's a, it's a real challenging time at the moment from a telesales perspective. Um, in 2002, we changed our name to something slightly snappier. Um, so General Welfare for the Blind became Clarity Employment for Blind People. Um, and I guess some of you that work in the disability sector will recognize that it's not always seen as politically correct to use the word blind and that in many organizations they say visually impaired. Um, I would love it if we could rebrand the whole charity and we talk about visual impairment, but the history of our organization again causes us some challenges sometimes. Um, so the recent past, um, a subset of a few of the um, products that we make, so you'll see up there hand sanitizers and room fragrances, everything, and dog shampoo's not even here, but we make dog shampoo, and there's an obvious connection with guide dogs. Um, and uh, I guess the recent past, we're, we're not, no longer at 250,000 customers, but at probably at more like 30,000. So we've gone from having a revenue of I don't know, above six million to just below three million. So we've really struggled. There's been some really difficult times um, in the 80s and 90s with lots of change. Um, and we're really now at a position of reinventing ourselves as something new. Um, so our products have been all over the place and uh, we produce over a million units a year. Um, by our calculations, we could be producing with a few changes, um, two million, and with a few different shifts during the day and maybe moving to seven day production, we could, we could easily produce three million units. So even for us, we could produce so much more. Um, there's big opportunity there. So in 2003, we moved to our current location, Hyams Park, which is just outside London ever so slightly. Um, but uh, we hired 29 new employees at that point, making 102 overall. So over 100 staff, the majority are in London. Um, and we have a production facility up in Keswick as well, where we make, in the Lake District, up in the north of England. Uh, we make handmade soaps there, and it's a, it's a beautiful workshop. I don't have that video for you today, um, but we will have something available in the next few weeks after some video making in January. Um, 
we launched Clarity as a brand um, in, the, in the sort of 2000s, so dropping all those other words about Clarity Employment for Blind People and the brand of Clarity, as you see on those labels there, was born. Um, <clears throat> And it's really been driving profitable revenue for a, a long time. Um, but telesales and other things, as I mentioned, really, this is, a, is an important point for us. So we need to look ahead at new market segments. Um, we, we certainly are having lots of positive conversations, which we'll hear about later on in the presentation, um, with a lot of customers that are beginning to catch on to what some women that were approached at the door 50 years ago said, yeah, I get, I get this. I understand the social mission. And now we're talking to very different organizations and, and people who also get the mission. So it's really, really encouraging. Um, we, we now work not just business to consumer, B2C, but we, we have a real focus on business to business sales, B2B, which is about us selling to other businesses. And there's loads of advantages to do that. Um, and we've also diversified from selling directly to people to maybe going indirectly through wholesalers, um, as many other people do if they wanted to scale. So we're beginning to do things just like other soap companies do, which should be encouraging, and that's exactly what we should be doing. That's enough of the history. I know my CEO probably could talk for about half an hour more on history, but um, I wasn't around at any of this point, so <laughs> hopefully this will be easier for me the next few sections. So. Um, I guess some of you are aware of the social enterprise sector in the UK. Um, if not, we'll just summarize a few important points, if that's okay, and um, hopefully still a useful summary. So social enterprise UK highlight, as, as um, Madara did quite well as well, the sort of where social enterprise sits, and um, we're not going to go into definitions here either, but it's, um, it's somewhere in the middle of charity and private sector with what I would consider the best bits of both. So business which trades for social purpose. And my definition of it, um, in a very simple way, is any organization that puts purpose ahead of profit. Um, it's pretty simple, and that's what we all should be doing. And um, I, I think it was a discussion at the table down here about whether legal structures were good or not. And I would love to think that this is business in the future. We just call it business. It's just good business. It's the right thing to do, um, and it's the right thing sustainably for your business in the future. Um, it's, uh, it's just the right decision. So as soon as we can move away from the term social enterprise, maybe it will take us 50 years, but um, that will be useful as well. So, key UK demographics. Um, so there's a few, um, I'll leave you to read through some um, points around growth and around innovation. So, in general, the sector is moving faster than non-social enterprises. There's loads more innovation, um, there's loads more jobs being created, um, and importantly, that last bullet point there about um, people with di disadvantaged people in the labor market. It's, um, it's really important that, that we're creating jobs where other organizations aren't. Um, communities, so it, it really does base organizations in those communities that need it most, um, employing local people um, and diversity. So I'm loving all the women that are in the room today and I uh, had a quick discussion with Tina about this earlier and we were discussing is, w what's the reason and I just like to think that the reason is because lots of women come from a background or uh, of just naturally caring more, either being a mother or whatever, but the role in society of caring. And for that to grow outside of your family unit, for you to care about the community, the country, the world, is a great, a great asset and something that, that we can bring more and more to. I'd love to see this conference in a year's time being 50% men and 50% women. Um, that's a, a good aim, but um, fly the flag um, for the women. It's a great start. Um, so there's a lot more stats that you can take a read of in this report from 2015 um, called the State of Social Enterprise Report. Um, that's run by Social Enterprise UK. Loads of findings in there and some really interesting um, statistics. So feel free to download that from their website. As far as key organizations that help us work, um, the one on the left is Social Enterprise Mark. They are a, um, an accreditation body, so you have to really step through all the processes to say, are you a social enterprise? Um, I think it was around before the one in the middle that's Social Enterprise UK. Um, social Enterprise UK is much more dynamic and scaling much faster. There's less rigor about whether you exactly meet certain criteria and the door is open in general to lots more organizations, which is helping us grow and be, uh, be a branding um, for social enterprise in the UK. 
Um, and then Made in Britain on the right hand side, obviously it's not social enterprise, but does work with lots of small to medium enterprises. And that stamp about things that are made in Britain is important for British people, I guess. Um, unfortunately, more so due to Brexit, and I apologize for Britain's behavior. Um, it's really been disappointing from my perspective, but um, from an environmental perspective, and many reasons, it is important to buy locally and not ship products across the world. Um, and then the last one down there is an organization called On Purpose, I came from On Purpose two years ago, so when I left consultancy, I joined On Purpose. It's a one-year leadership development program for people transitioning from the charitable sector or from the private sector into the middle. So it's a meeting of minds, you do a one-year program, um, and uh, five, four and a half days a week you're at a placement, so you do two placements during the time, six months each, um, and you have a coach and a mentor, and every Friday afternoon the group gets together and discusses a social problem, or um, thinks about human-centered design, or legal structures, um, or finance for social enterprises, I mean, the creativity, the, it was very broad, and those sessions are run by business leaders, social enterprise leaders, charity leaders, to really allow us to get the boast of both worlds. So that opened up in the UK in 2010. Um, and subsequently, I think in 2013 in Paris, and, um, or was it 2014 in Paris, and 2015 in Berlin. So On Purpose is now in, in three countries, um, and I can't wait to see On Purpose Latvia. And um, if any of you think this is perfect for Latvia, I'd be more than happy to put you in touch with the international team at On Purpose to see how discussions could shape up in years to come. Um, so uh, two more, so the School of Social Entrepreneurs really works with people that have great ideas. Um, on purpose is a bit different because it doesn't work with people that have the ideas, but it works with the people that have the ability to scale and replicate organizations that have um, business sort of sense to write the business models and really stick to them and, and shape up the efficiency of organizations. So on purpose is not about creating new social enterprises, it's about strengthening the social enterprises that already exist. Uh, School for Social Entrepreneurs does the opposite and it takes great ideas and, and takes them through on mentoring programs. Um, and the last one there on the right um, around the B Corp movement which came across from the US and in, uh, in 2015 moved into the UK. Um, it's now in quite a few countries around the world and that's I guess where we see sort of socially responsible businesses. Um, and I, I love that Social Enterprise UK and B Corps, um, there's a great atmosphere between them in the UK. A little bit competitive but um, also opening the door that you could be a B corporation and a social enterprise. Um, so, so the door is definitely open. Um, and last two, um, so business in the community is, is run for big businesses to get involved and, and how, they can, how they can work with charities and small organizations. So we're a member of that and it allows us to reach out to lots of big corporates and uh, maybe for volunteering, for funding, for supply chain, for us to actually sell to them. Um, again, could be doing things more efficiently to help us, um, but stays as a, a neutral body in the middle working for both sides. Um, and then Deloitte Social Pioneers, lots of the big five, so PwC, EY, they're all doing things to do with social enterprise. Um, Ernst & Young just recruited someone as sort of a program lead for social enterprise in the UK. There's a, there's a real drive and understanding that big business like this wants to work with, with social enterprises. Maybe more, more so than charities. In the future you can see the marriage of uh, corporate social responsibility budgets um, and instead of giving those to a program that they then ask for a report on, they're actually buying our products to go in their supply chains, which is just the most sustainable way forward of them using their money. Um, so that's, that's, that's the main organizations that maybe I see in the UK. There's probably more, especially on the public service side, public sector side. Um, but let's focus on Social Enterprise UK specifically. So I would definitely see that they have, have led the way in the last few years, some really strong branding, marketing campaigns. Um, and it's an important point from today, marketing is a, such an important part of social enterprise. We have to tell the story in a way that will bring in those, um, those customers, the big business, the, the, the people that work in government. We have to be speaking their language. We have to know what they value. Um, so social enterprise has done a good job of this so far. We've been impressed with what they've done um, and, uh, and membership is growing. Um, so it's all going well. Um, we, I've written here that it brings together different forms of social enterprises and um, maybe now is a good time to confirm that we're a social firm, so we use that definition um, as a social firm because we are employing people that are disadvantaged. Um, so 
there are lots of social enterprises that act just like normal businesses and then they take their profits and they give them to water projects in, in India and they are far more efficient as a business than we are. They can provide products and services much cheaper but there's no social value inherently in the, the things they do on a day-to-day -day basis. So we have created a much harder job for ourselves by having a workforce that's 80% people with disabilities or long-term health conditions, but not really for that reason. The reason that it's difficult is we have a transitional workforce. So lots of people coming and going all the time. It's really difficult to run a business in that way, um, but lots of advantages too. So there's a a few other notes there about Social Enterprise UK um, and I'm going to show you now one of the videos that they produced a couple of years ago and we had a few conversations with them afterwards because our soap is not in the video so you'll spot a few products in the video um, you can imagine I'm sure where the soap could have gone if we had been closer to them a few years ago so um, let's let's play the video Imagine your money could really mean change. Social enterprises are businesses that reinvest their profits. They put people and planet first. From caring for children in developing countries to supporting the communities we're part of. Buying from social enterprises takes your spending much further. What we buy can educate, nurture and empower providing solutions to some of the world's greatest challenges. Whether it's reducing food waste, supplying clean, safe water, producing affordable green energy, or getting people back into employment. At work or at play, there is a social enterprise for just about everything. There are more than 70,000 in the UK led and supported by inspiring people all over the country, including some familiar faces. Join the revolution, buy social and unleash your spending power. a good summary for you. Can you imagine the soap up there? Can you imagine? It's just not there, is it? Um, unfortunately. Um, but it's a great video and they do a really good job. And um, by social as a badge is also being used in Canada now. And I know that they discuss how it can go to other countries. So um, let's not recreate the wheel with you guys having a slightly different logo. But um, I don't know if you're doing something similar already. Apologies if you are. But if not, like jump on this and um, take it forward here um, if, it, if you think it might work for you. But Buy Social is the consumer-facing logo, so it's on the back of our products. I'm just going to move from the mic microphone for a second. So you, you might have spotted some of the products at the front. I had to check in my luggage at the airport, unfortunately, to carry liquids. Um, <laughs> but this is our newest brand, the Soap Co, that we'll talk about in a minute, that was launched um, a year and a half ago. Um, and proudly on the back, we hold that logo of Social Enterprise, this Buy Social campaign, as well as our Made in Britain logo, which is important for, for customers to know that it's local. Um, Frustratingly, they've just updated the branding and you'll see new branding soon on their website. So our 50,000 labels that we have in stock will now have the wrong logo, but um, we'll still keep using it um, for a while. But new products will have the new logo on soon. So we want, we want everyone to be proudly putting this logo on products and they have a range of logos that can be used in different places as well. Um, an important part of, of the... Um, of the campaign from Buy Social is not just business to consumer, but is business to business. So this brings us on to the next part around the Buy Social corporate challenge. Um, so this was launched, I think, it's just having its first birthday now, um, and it's it's a phenomenal aim. We might not quite get to the target that you can see there of one billion pounds being procured through um, from social enterprises by 2020, um, but it's a really good aim, and there's some massive businesses involved. Um, we're moving in the right direction and um, showing you some of the logos in a second, but you know, they're outside Downing Street. Um, 
and uh, supported by the Cabinet Office from a government perspective, business and the community that you heard about earlier, and Social Enterprise UK. So the marriage of these three organisations really helping business, big business, to do things in a different way. Uh, and it's really important for the social enterprise sector to have big business engaged. So here are some of the big businesses. So Santander, um, Zurich and RBS Group, which are all sort of in finance or insurance sector in the UK. Um, Interserve, which is a facilities management company. Waits is a large building company. PwC, global accounting firm. And Johnson & Johnson, what I would maybe consider to be one of our competitors. <laughs> um, they make soap as well. And we had a conversation with them a few months ago and said, what can we do together? And they said, mm, nothing. And then we said, you, let's start thinking about what we could do together because really you're not thinking that a multi billion pound global organization um, is, a, is threatened by a three million pound charity. Um, they changed their tune pretty quickly and they are phenomenal. Um, I'm really impressed with Johnson & Johnson, um, led by some amazing people, have, have great vision and values as a corporate. Um, and yeah, we're, we're now engaged with them. Our soap, touch wood, wherever wood is, um, we might soon be in the Johnson & Johnson offices as the soap in the bathrooms. And that would be saying a lot for a charity of our size that we can be supplying one of the largest soap manufacturers in the world with product. Um, but a load of other things we can do. So we can have skills-based volunteering with them. Um, we, can, we can provide, um, we can actually make products for them. Um, lots of things we can do. So looking forward to, to the future where we work with all of these organizations. So at the moment, these are the flagship organizations within Bisocial Corporate Challenge. At the moment, we are producing soap for Santander in all of their head offices in the UK. Um, so there's a lot of soap because there's a lot of people. Um, PwC, we provide the soap for the executive bathroom. So that's this stuff. Um, the, the soap for Santander is our other range, which is Clarity, at a lower price point. You really have to provide products at different price points to, to match different people's requirements. Um, we're talking to Interserve, and hopefully they'll be helping us getting into the Cabinet Office and attend Downing Street soon with our soap. Um, we met with Waits last week to talk about how we work with construction sites, how we have welcome packs that go into new homes when they're built. Um, we're in discussions with Zurich and RBS. Um, so things are really moving. Um, so Biosocial Corporate Challenge is, has been a driving force behind that. Um, I hope it would have happened anyway, but it's great for, for these organizations to really be um, standing behind their commitment and, and showing that um, they can procure in a better way. So why are they engaged? Um, well, from their customers' perspective, 84% of customers think that corporates should be doing more for society. It's an obvious one. We would all agree as well, I'm sure. Um, but on the business side, 20% increase in the bottom line for those companies that have sort of a clear corporate social responsibility strategy. So they should be more effective as an organization. Um, it really does attract talent. So we need to be talking to companies and help them work with us because they will retain more talent. Um, if Accenture, when I'd been there, was buying social and doing all these things, maybe I wouldn't have left. Um, and then impacting the team, so less turnover of staff. Um, so that's an important one as well. These are really useful stats that another social enterprise called Wild Hearts um, have, have curated for us, um, which I hope you'll agree are, are really useful, and I'm sure lots of them are international, so you could use them over here as well. Um, so this is a quote from uh, a managing partner at PwC. I'm not going to read it off the screen, um, but it's great for them to be, to, to be seeing that they really see um, the purpose of social enterprise and why, why they're doing what they're doing. It's pretty clear with statements like that. So a case study, here's PwC. So we started working with them last year and we're rolling out after a successful trial. We're now rolling out in 29 offices. So lovely, expensive soap in a nice steel bottle holder screwed to the wall so no one can steal the bottles. Um, and it, it shows PwC's customers and employees what they stand for as an organization. So there's then a sticker on the mirror that explains a little bit more of the story with our web address. Uh, we're also involved with sending newsletters out to their staff. We do um, sort of Christmas fairs where we can sell our products to their staff. All of those things so there's a, there's a lot we can do together but there's a lot more we can do together as well and it's just the beginning of these journeys um, and uh, there's Kevin Ellis with a lovely photo and another quote specifically about our organization um, and this went in a national newspaper PwC were promoting us without even telling us uh, it was in, in a national newspaper 
um, a few months ago. Great news there. Um, lastly, just a very quick one from Accenture. So there's a testimonial of, of what they see, why, they, why they're doing what they're doing. And again, I won't read it from the slide, but they're happy. Um, they love the soap, and they are now getting emails from their staff saying, good decision, we love the soap in the bathrooms. Um, at no other corporate would they ever receive an email talking about soap in the bathroom. It's such an inconsequential thing. So if we can provide some good engagement for their staff, they win and we absolutely win. We can employ people with disabilities due to the sales just from Accenture. Um, it's, it's days of employment, it's training, um, and it's, it's fantastic. We're really pleased to have them behind us. Um, so we'll move on to our social value and apologies, I'm little bit over you're fine good I'm fine too um, all right great so talking about our social value then so this is Ozzy Ozzy works on the soap manufacturing line and um, so bar soaps he probably can make a couple of hundred in a day but he's um, a great spirit in the factory as well um, really really love Ozzy and um, Every Wednesday, he comes around and sells raffle tickets. Um, so there's a, there's a raffle every week at Clarity. And he'll come in and he'll say, OK, so today there's um, two pillows and a bottle of vodka and a picture frame, um, chocolate, some chocolate and some biscuits. And that's on offer. Can I have a pound for a raffle ticket? And nearly all the staff join this, um, and the proceeds go to social events, uh, days, day, day trips and things for our staff. But it's also a really great thing to get staff together on a weekly basis. And uh, I've never won, um, but <laughs> I plough money in nearly every week. <laughs> um, so this is Aussie. Um, so some of the key statistics. So every year we provide more than 10,000 days of employment. We create dozens of new jobs across London and Cumbria, um, also in um, Glasgow in Scotland and in Portsmouth in the south of England where we have two telesales um, sites. So dozens of new jobs. And most of those jobs are um, for people that are returning to work after a period of unemployment. So um, we often talk about Clarity and they say, oh, that's the charity that works with blind people. And we say, well, it's not quite, and we don't like talking about us like that either, but we are a pan-disability organization. Um, so that's everything from a lady who came and joined us last year that had had reconstructive back surgery. She had been lying down for three years. Um, this could literally happen to anyone after an accident, and um, I'm really glad that there are organizations like ours to get people back into work, um, becoming confident again, and, and confidence is the main point. point. Um, everyone is capable of working, and confidence is such a big knock for some people. Um, you heard on the video earlier Ron, who's late 40s and has never worked until last year when he got a job with Clarity. Never worked. He's got severe epilepsy. No other employer would take him. We have to be more inclusive as a society because he's capable of working, he wants to work, and there are loads of other advantages to it, which we'll hear about in a minute. So we'll talk also in a minute about mainstream employment, but um, staff really are encouraged to move back into mainstream employment. We want to help them get jobs elsewhere once that confidence is built up. Um, so that's dozens on a yearly basis. I think it was about 46 last year um, that moved into mainstream employment. And the government did some quick calculations and said for, for every pound that they invest um, in the specialist government scheme called Work Choice, which helps people with disabilities get back into work, so for every one pound in, there's two pounds 65 worth of value to the country. It's a no-brainer. It's the right thing to do for government funds as well as for every other reason. Um, <clears throat> so let's move on and talk about um, my CEO has been talking about this iceberg of social value for years and he never drew it so I use this conference as an opportunity to draw it um, for him so he often talks about these things so what do we measure we measure the number of hours of employment and then we convert that into the number of days of employment or the number of jobs created. They're all from the same me uh, measure here of number of hours. It's a really important measure, and that's the top of the iceberg. And as with icebergs, typically 90 or so percent of their volume is below, and this is the list of the stuff that actually we're doing. Reduce burden on the healthcare system, improve confidence, reduce spend on welfare and benefits, reduce reliance on close family, friendships and new social ties, cohesive communities, new career options, professional development, improve self-worth and purpose, financial independence and improved mental health. It's a pretty long list and I think we could speak to most of the staff and they could add another couple to that. But it really is more than just a job. 
Um, it's a super special place and I'm privileged to be working there. Um, the burden on family is really something that maybe is good to touch upon, but there are some staff that live at home with their, their mother and father as adults. Um, they're maybe in their 30s and their parents still care for them every day um, until they get a job at Clarity and then for two days a week they're with us and they don't need an assistant to help them because everyone in the factory helps each other. So if there's someone with a visual impairment that needs to go to the bathroom and they're new, someone without even asking will say, oh, can I grab your hand? And just walk them, walk them towards the bathrooms. It is an inclusive workplace. We're not specially designed with ramps and lifts and we are a normal workplace. We've got some guide dog cages, but that's it. We're a normal workplace and people help each other and that's just how it should be. Um, so I hope you like the iceberg. We'll, we'll make it even better next time, but um, hopefully a good summary for you of, of what we're doing. Um, a few specific staff stories then. So this is Darren. Um, there's some text and quotes from Darren. Um, he had a mental breakdown and um, still on a daily basis, like if you try and put a, a camera in front of his face, he'll, he really doesn't want to be photographed. So we use the same photo often now for Darren, so he doesn't have to have any more done. Um, but he has massive confidence issues. It's huge. Um, but uh, about three months ago, we promoted him to a team leader. He showed such leadership and guidance and care for staff. He's very capable of, of being a phenomenal part of Clarity in the future. Um, so I, I love Darren's story. This is Sandra. Sandra. Um, as it might have said there, or maybe I cut it out because there's too many words on the slide, but Sandra was working for 20 years in a local government office and she was made redundant. And she has a hearing impairment, but she is one of the best lip readers I've, <laughs> I've ever seen. She's fantastic and she works in the lab. So she does viscosity testing and pH testing. Sorry for the translators, I didn't warn you of those words. Um, but yeah, lots of, lots of chemical testing to make sure that our products are, are as good as they should be. Um, but she's, she's lovely, she's great, um, and she really is um, uh, such a positive energy. There's most people in the factory actually, really positive energy and love coming to work. It's, it's also sort of very social place. Um, even better said by some of our staff in the next video. So this was made um, by a pro professional filmmaking company that does one pro bono free film a year, um, and we, we, love, we love the film. Um, and for our brand, The Soap Co., it works really well. So um, we'll show you our video next. Yeah, I like the job actually. I like, I like, um, I like talking to people. I quite like doing the tenor announcements. Could Kevin Lyons please return to the switchboard? Could Kevin Lyons return to the switchboard? Thank you. <laughs> no, I, I was not born blind. I was not born blind. My sight loss has been from when I was born. I was uh, born three months premature and lost my eyesight because I was given too much oxygen. Um, too much anaesthetic. Which triggered off immaculate degeneration. The hardest thing I've had to overcome in life is sight loss. Um, you never ever accept it, but you have to just deal with it in the best way that you can. It's easy to sit back and say, oh, I'm blind, I can't do this, I can't see that. But I said, no, I want to get up, I want to get on with life. Being visually impaired, you, you need a focus and you need to be doing something. I get to work via public transport. I have to get a bus and then a tube. I then go to Euston on the Northern Line. On the District Line, the Piccadilly Line. And then a bus and it takes... It's between an hour and 15 minutes, an hour and a half. An hour and 15 minutes to get to work. I found that a lot of employers um, are reluctant to take on board vision impaired people. A blind person with disabilities or somebody disabled can often give loyalty and can be very good at timekeeping because they realise how valuable the job is. My dad's attitude was, get out there son, get a job, earn your money. I don't really see it as the money, it's more like, it's more like, because um, we're like, more like a family. Oh, if people can't see, everyone thinks the worst, you know, but we are, we're not silly, you know, um, you know and we can be trained. Um, it just takes a little bit longer at times, that's all. I'm very much for employers taking on disabled people. You know, employers need encouragement to take disabled people on. Having a job at the SoCo company has changed my life immensely. And I mean, I was at rock bottom 12, 
12 years ago, so it was 11 and a half years ago. And I, I, I would say I'm very, I'd say I'm more like, I don't know what they call it, top, but I'm, I'm at, I don't think you can get any, well, I don't think you can get any higher than I am. Um, I wasn't happy, I'm happy. I didn't have a companion, now I've got a dog. I was in debt, now I'm not. If you could give Soapco a message now, imagine you were looking down the lens and they were watching this video back, what would you like to say to them? I would like to say to Soapco, thank you. An employer must see a disabled person as an asset rather than a hindrance. Um, taking a disabled person on, see them as a human being rather than just look at their disability. You, you just do what normal people do, you just, you know, get on with life. I like doing a proper roast dinner with, with the spuds and stuff, but I must admit I cheat, I use the Aunt Bessie's, but the trick with that is to put a bit of oil in the pan first and then they come up really crispy. Um, it's a pretty impactful video. Um, sometimes we're in business development meetings with big corporates and someone sitting with their suit and tie and sitting in the chair and engaging a little bit and listening a little bit um, and then we play videos like that. We've had a few conversations that have totally turned around and one guy that said just before my father passed away he, he went blind. And you realize it really affects everyone, and we just have to be storytellers. We have to tell the story to promote social enterprise, um, and it's through organizations like that, which are profit-making, video-making firms, we have to engage with them. And honestly, most social enterprises can't afford to pay, so we have to also be really good at asking for stuff for free. Um, lastly, apologies that um, there was an English joke at the end that I'm guessing 95% of the room didn't get. Um, some English people wouldn't have understood it either, but um, it was about roast, roast potatoes on our Sunday roast and how Stephen cheats and gets the frozen ones from the supermarket and just puts them in the oven. Um, anyway, apologies for that. So um, just moving onwards then, let's talk a little bit about our employment model. Um, so, 25% of the staff at Clarity um, are what we, and we don't use these terms inside the organisation at all, um, we're, we're one, one workforce, um, but 25% of the, the staff um, are retained so that the business can run effectively. Um, I can't tell you the number of times I've come in on a Monday morning and I've seen that we've got a few dozen orders and I've gone, great, this is brilliant. I've walked downstairs and someone has literally walked out. It's too much for them. They, they're stressed and they just leave <laughs> um, and over at Christmas I think the CEO one evening packed up 40 boxes um, we got out about 4,000 boxes um, in the run-up to Christmas um, sorry just in one week in the run-up to Christmas and sometimes we just have to muck in and and help those boxes get out the door the core team is incredibly important um, secondly the transitional workforce so through the government program that's called Work Choice, um, people are encouraged. It's not a mandatory program, but the people are encouraged that have a disability or a long-term health condition, encouraged back into work. So many people will come, as we've talked earlier, for confidence reasons or... Uh, everyone has their own story, totally individual, and we will work with that individual. They might be in Clarity on a Monday, and by two weeks' time, they could have a job elsewhere and be gone. They could be with us for years. It's totally individual, but in general, the, the placement is for six months um, and they're encouraged by a government intermediary to move on as quickly as they can. Um, it's not a perfect system. Um, sometimes people are moved on too quickly and sometimes people are kept on too long. Um, but uh, it's not, it, this is not the type, part of the organization that I work in, but I think they do a phenomenal effort. Um, and, uh, and I'm learning a lot about, about the government policy and things at the same time. But please don't ask me any difficult policy questions. Um, I will try to answer, but probably put you in touch with someone else in the team. Um, and then there is um, the sort of the last, the last portion of employment um, uh, with staff that probably couldn't work elsewhere for a number of reasons. Um, and we will keep them at Clarity as long as we possibly can, as long as that's what they want. Um, so I guess you could say that this is the original mission of the charity. So back in 1854, it was about providing employment for life. And we even, I think in the 
late 1800s, we made some houses, we built some houses, and um, our staff are, you know, still a few generations later living in those houses. It really was a job for life back then. Um, but because of government policy, and I think probably the right thing to do is to have more of a transitional workforce where we as a social firm and social enterprise help people back into the mainstream workforce. And we're really proving by having a luxury brand like this that people with disabilities can make a luxury product. Of course they can. We all know that this is the case because we're, we're all the same and we all have different, different skills and different barriers. Everyone in this room has a barrier. Some of our staff have visible barriers and others don't. And Neither do I, but um, we all have barriers, that's for sure. Um, so the Work Choice Programme has been running since 20, I think it was 2010, um, and it's been fantastic, but the, the fee that we get from the government is around £4,800 per person per year. Um, that doesn't cover employment costs, definitely doesn't, um, but it's a good start. Um, since 2010, that number has not increased, so it's still £4,800. Um, our costs have increased, obviously. We've moved factories, we've developed products, uh, wages have gone up, input costs have gone up. Um, it's increasingly a challenge. Um, hence, again, why we have to produce products that maybe have a little bit more profit margin in them, a little bit more of a cushion for us. Um, so, along with the 100 and I think it's six, 106 employees we have at the moment, we also have about a dozen volunteers. These volunteers are phenomenal. Um, we have someone that comes in and walks the dogs every single day. She takes them out for a walk, she washes them at the, vet, the veterinary surgery across the road, and she brings them back and she gives the dogs a massage to get treated really well. Um, uh, her name's Caroline and she's an artist as well and does sculptures and phenomenal. So great for her to, to be involved in the organization. We're, we're very lucky. Um, other volunteers from universities, so last summer we had 15 university students working in a, a variety of different departments, um, specifically areas like green chemistry. So we had PhD students from Cambridge University, Imperial College London, master's students in fluid dynamics, lots of different um, backgrounds, but they wanted work experience. Well, work experience is really difficult to find, especially when it's valuable, and nowhere else would they be let loose to make soap and build green chemistry formulations that are better for our environment and help us um, produce the next, uh, the next products that Clarity and the Soap Go are going to bring to market this year. Um, the environmental side is growing within Clarity. Um, it wasn't really a focus 10 years ago or even two years ago, but it's absolutely a focus now. And people that buy these products, they care about social, that also means they care about the environment. So you cannot be a social enterprise that says, oh, we're, we're really helping people, but there's the rubbish dump over there of all the stuff that we've wasted or whatever. And I know there's another talk this afternoon uh, about sort of materials and wastage, but um, I will maybe not leave um, the pulpit now, but there's a bar of soap at the front that bar of soap is made up in the Lake District at our, our production facility. It's made in traditional methods, hand mixed, hand cut, hand stamped with our logo and also hand stamped with the name of the person that made the product. It's totally unique, every single bar. It's then wrapped in a bioplastic film which looks and feels just like plastic but it's made from wood pulp. It can be thrown in your food compost. The outside is unbleached, 100% recycled, recyclable paper. Again, can be recycled fully. Even the sticker on the back is fully biodegradable, and the glue that's been used is non-toxic biotech glue. We've gone into the detail, and again, sorry for the translators, because I didn't give you that text up front, but we, we really want to think about that. So if someone cares about the environment, buy a bar of soap because it's not 80% water and you're not shipping water around the world, which is what happens most of the time. Um, and we're, doing, we're making big strides here, so 25% of the packaging here is made from milk bottles, which are uh, sort of, so recycled 25% content. Um, there's a lot more we can do, and the eco formulations we're bringing out soon will we'll definitely do that. So the volunteers are great. They help us see that vision and they provide um, resource to, to really help us do that. We also have multi-millionaire volunteers that arrive in their Ferraris and Lamborghinis and they've got to the age of 50 or 60 and they've said, I don't want to do this anymore. What shall I do with my time that's just a bit more fun and maybe I can feel less guilty about what I've done in life. <laughs> um, I, there's no need to feel guilty. They're doing good stuff now um, and it's fantastic. They help us with strategy and commercial models and business plans um, they've even come with me to some of my meetings where I have to go and meet a 
50 or 60 year old man that um, doesn't really want to have a business meeting with a young female. Uh, sexism is across the world, unfortunately, still in the UK too. So sometimes I have to take a sidekick with me that probably doesn't know much about the subject matter, but just helps me broker conversations. Um, really frustrating, but I will happily use these volunteers if they're happy to be used to help us get as many sales as we possibly can. So that's the employment model. Let's move on to the plan. And um, this is the last section. So. Um, the business in the past has had the Clarity products and then recently we've had the Soapco. So um, just to give you a little bit of background here, so September 2015, um, I'd been with the organization for about four months. My task was to launch a new brand and it was the busiest summer of my entire life and I didn't have any skills to do this, literally. No skills, I had commercial skills, but I didn't have any branding or understanding of what goes in a bottle and, and how we produce this. It was enlightening. Um, Within, I think, three months, we were in front of a major supermarket chain. I pulled the bottle out of the bag and put it on the table, and she said, I love it. When can we get, when, when can we get them? And I said, well, it's not quite ready yet. It's um, in the concept phase. By September, we could do it. What would the minimum order be? And she said, um, one box of each. And I thought, one box? 12 bottles, is that what a major supermarket chain is going to start with? Then we have to be very patient. And actually, I decided, no, we're not gonna do this. And I'm really glad we didn't do it because now we're, we're taking these products elsewhere where they're, they're more valued. Um, so we're not going with supermarket chains for now, but this is our brand. This is our luxury ethical brand. And it's not doing everything right on an environmental front yet. It is on an ethical front. We know who our suppliers are. We're trying our very best um, and, uh, and we're moving in the right direction. But the design, we've won design awards already and we're really excited about where this is going this year. Um, so key commercial aims, as we look forward to 2020, um, last year we signed off a four year strategy um, and this is what we're gonna do. So number one, strengthen existing commercial relationships. So I talked about the telesales side of the organization. We need that to continue. It probably won't grow, but we need it to stop declining. <laughs> so um, there's a lot of work we have to do to protect our revenue from the history um, and heritage of the organization. So we're absolutely gonna do that. We're also going to build new commercial relationships, and that's, that's mostly my role. Um, it's a little bit scary when you see the numbers we're going to try and get to in the next few years, but I'm standing behind this, and we're going to make it happen. Um, so we're going to build new relationships with hotels, companies, whoever we can, as long as there's a profit margin in it, and profit margin to us means employing people. So we'll do what we can there. Lastly is to promote the brand um, and cre increase brand awareness. It's all about marketing. Any brand like this, any service that you provide, you have to know how to tell the story. And um, I mean, we're 160 something years old. Um, most people have never heard of us. We just hired a marketing manager and it was her first day yesterday. So marketing will be much better looking forward. Um, so it's great to have the support of our charitable board to sign off these funds so that we can employ people that are specialists in this area and, and we won't have to struggle anymore to make videos like the ones you've seen. We're gonna have experts to help us. Um, so looking at routes to market. So currently, or let's say a few years ago, it was about telesales, it was about contract production, which we haven't really spoken about today, but we make around 800,000 units a year for other companies. No branding, no mention of us, just silence on the bottle. It's just a, a bottle of soap or um, we pack up toothpaste and lots of other things we ship all over the world. No mention of clarity. So disappointing. I want to make sure that clarity is mentioned on every single bottle that goes out in the factory in the future. We need to start transforming people's um, views on disability and we do that often by something on a label. We also make a lot of bespoke products. But let's look forward. We're gonna keep doing telesales. We're gonna keep doing that too. We're gonna do more dual branding. E-commerce is a big route for us. So feel free to take a look at our, we have three websites as an organization, but the soapcode.org is the, is the main one for the new brand. We're gonna get into welcome packs for everyone that buys a new kitchen in the country, in the UK, everyone that buys a new kitchen, I want our soap to be given as a free gift every time someone buys a kitchen. At the moment, they give a Chinese cookbook. The biggest kitchen company in the UK gives a Chinese cookbook as a gift. How easy is it for us to change and influence that and provide a better product? So retailers, we're absolutely going to national retail this year. It's going to be difficult. They're going to be small orders. We have to be patient, um, but it's so important for us in our growth. 
office bathrooms. Um, every corporate in the country is a target for us. Anyone with 5,000 or more employees uses a lot of soap. That soap in the bathrooms, not very sexy, but soap in a dispenser in the bathroom, we want to fill every one of those dispensers. So we'll do that. And then if it's a client-facing floor or an expensive law firm or a design agency, we're going to sell them the more expensive soap. We've got a range for everyone. And if you want to buy dog shampoo as a vet, you can buy dog shampoo too. Um, and then events and conferences, we want to be out there in the right places, our products in front of the, um, the people that are going to buy them. So this is, this is roughly our strategy. There's 160 slides of it. You won't be seeing that today. Um, so more than just social, um, we've touched on the environmental side, we've touched on the local side, and we've touched on the diverse supply chain. If you want to create a social enterprise that's uh, fast-moving consumer goods, FMCG or something else, you need to be thinking about all of them. Customers care about where products come from, what's in the product, increasingly so. Um, and companies want to buy from small to medium enterprises, UK-based organisations, uh, organisations that are led by women or organisations with people with disabilities or, or um, more diverse workforces. We can do all of these things and probably most social enterprises that you create in the future target all of them at the same time. Um, so product roadmap, very quickly, we're going to look at the SOAPCO products, we're going to um, create new eco-formulations, uh, the testing is underway and it's super exciting. Um, two new fragrances, we're going to have sea salt and samphire, um, wild herbs and English pear coming out this year, super exciting, or two of those three. Um, and we're going to accredit it under EU eco-label uh, regulations. Uh, we really want to be accredited. Even if the UK is going to leave the EU, we still want to accredit under the EU eco label. We think they're doing fantastic work um, and, uh, and hopefully that won't change after Brexit. Um, and then we're going to the hotel market. Um, not yet, it'll be 2018. Um, and then Clarity. Well, we've got over 100 products. There's another brand with another 100 products that I haven't even mentioned today. Um, obviously, we will want to reduce the range. So it's not always about growing, but we have to think about whether that's the right thing to do. New formulations, again, some eco formulations. Uh, we want to accredit the factory with ISO 9001, which is a quality standard. Um, so there's lots to do. And just things like putting barcodes on the back of the products. Sounds really easy. It takes a lot of time when you've got hundreds of products. So if you want to go into retail for clarity, that's what we'll be doing next. So entering national retail. Um, shouldn't be talking about any of this today because we're in the middle of buyer meetings at the moment. It's really exciting. It's pretty top secret and I won't mention the names of the organizations we're talking to and maybe you wouldn't know them anyway. Um, but this summer we will be in some leading high-end department stores in the UK, um, some of which with an international footprint. So again, we'll start small, but we're going we're gonna to do it. And um, there's a brochure on the front. Please don't take it because I've only got one and it's a, a concept brochure, but there's a brochure for our retail offering, which you know, that's the front cover. Um, there's some information in there about where our bottles come from and our branding. Um, our products and the inside of our beautiful soap bars and the soap pebble we're bringing to market later this year. Um, some of the retailers we're currently in, small independent retailers that really share our mission. And, uh, and some of the reviews we've had and, and some of the videos that you've just seen. Um, so we really want to shout about our coverage in National Press and in Tatler Magazine and all these other places, which is done probably mostly through goodwill of big organizations that want to help us and see us successful. So uh, last, last slide. Um, I can't read that. Um, but my Latvian colleague put it on there, and she also put on this bit. So sustainable revenue stream is the only way for a sustainable impact, and here it is in Latvian. Is that about right? Yeah, cool, great. I'd love to give her a pay rise. We need to sell some more soap first. Um, okay, and so my, my final thoughts are, find the money. So it's really important for you to target a service or a product that actually has a bit of profit margin. Really important because if you don't have the profit margin, your social enterprise will cost more to run. You'll be ethical about where you buy things from, who you employ. Um, all of those practices cost money. So if you are going to start opening up a toothbrush factory and selling a toothbrush for a euro, I hope there's not a social enterprise that does this already. No, probably not. Um, but you probably won't succeed. It's going to be a really difficult market. So try and choose something with a bit of leeway and is not a commoditized product. Secondly, ensure that there's real outcomes and impacts. Something for someone to see is great, or numbers in a report, however you want to do it, but just show the real impact, because there's a lot of opportunities to do good things. 
carefully balance social and financial. This is probably always going to be the hardest one, and there'll be decisions that you're just not sure if they're the right thing to do. So if we plow more money into making the formulations better, it's going to cost us more money. It's going to be a lower profit margin for our social mission, but we want to be environmental as well. So how do we balance these things? It's really, really difficult, but we have to balance it constantly. Um, build something scalable and replicable. Um, I'd love our social enterprise to just be replicated over here. Just let's find a way of doing it. Um, and that's the same for so many social enterprises. No, I don't want to just come here and sell soap. I want to make sure that you're making soap here that does the same job at the same scale and has the same intentions. And then we learn from you and you learn from us. And there's no way competition here. Um, we want to do things together. And, and, and that's the right thing to do. Lastly, don't underestimate good marketing. It's so easy to underestimate it, but please don't. Um, uh, that's pretty much it for me. Um, I think I had some Latvian phrase that was, um, thank you for your attention, so let's try it. So, paldies pa uzmanibu? Yeah, right, cool. Um, thank you very much, guys. Uh, liels, liels, uh, liels, liels, paldies, uh, Kamilai, par, uh, par brīnišķīgo stāstu un prezentācijas. Nezinu, kā jūs, es ļoti daudz lietas pierakstīju un jau izpētīju, ko es, ko es gribu iegūglēt un, uh, un uh, ko es gribētu paskatīties. Uh, Kamila, do you have a headset with you? Jā. Yeah. Uh, Un tagad, un tagad pirmsmais, pirmsmais pārējiem pie, pie diskusijas, jo, jo es ļoti, ļoti gribētu, ka jūs pie saviem galdiņām arī pārunājat tās svarīgākās, svarīgākās atzīmes un lietas, ko jūs saklausījāt. Bet varbūt ir, ir kādi jautājumi jums. Mums ir laiks apvēram vienam diviem jautājumiem no zāles, ko jūs gribētu Kamilai pajautāt. Vai ir kādam kāds jautājums, kur mums ir brīvprātīgi ar mikrofoniem? Tā, re, kur dacē jautājums? Ok. Ok. <laughs> ja neviens vēl nav, tāpēc, ka mēs esam kaut arī latvieši. Uh, es varu arī angliski vaicāt? Latviski un, un Kamilai pārpulkos. Ah, labi. Uh, es tieši par to mārketingu gribēju vaicāt, tā kā vakardien ir sākusi kolēģi strādāt. Um, un Latvijā viens no tādiem kolosāliem uh, arī sociālajiem uzņēmējiem, ļoti lētiem rīkiem, ja zin, kā to izmantot, ir sociālie mēdīji Facebooks. Vai tas Lielbritānijā arī strādā un vai tas ir tas kanāls, ko jūs arī mēģināsiet papildināt telefoniem, tradicionāliem mēdījiem, sociāliem mēdījiem, kas varētu arī tā kā sasniegt to tās durvis, kas varbūt līdz šim par jūsu uzņēmu vispār nezinu. Vai tas vispār rūlē? Varbūt tā, ka Facebooks rūlē Latvijā arī šajā tēmā, bet varbūt Lielbritānijā tas nav tas kanāls. Um, so, that's a bit odd with the hats. <laughs> um, there's a lot of things I didn't talk about today, so social media is one of them. Feel free to have a look on our Instagram account for the Soap Co. as an example. So, uh, we launched our social media efforts on Twitter and Pinterest um, when we first launched in 2015. Pinterest was a difficult one, perhaps. Um, maybe not the right thing to, to do. Um, but we have done so with an organization called Digital Mums. So Digital Mums uh, is another social enterprise and they help women back into work. So women that have come from marketing backgrounds or PR backgrounds um, and maybe had a break to have children, they bring them back into the workforce. It's a phenomenal organization and I'm very proud that our organization is supporting other social enterprises like Digital Mums. So they run our social media channels. Someone does a six month course with Digital Mums and then they graduate um, and we've kept, um, kept them on to, to run the channels after, after that. So I would say that the social media for the Soap Co is pretty strong. Still not enough followers, as everyone has these problems, but it's pretty strong. Um, and Clarity is improving. Uh, Clarity has a lot more um, people following, but there wasn't a lot of engagement for, for many years. So um, we're, we're growing that, and social media is incredibly important. Yeah. Okay. And why are there any questions? Yeah, Rekudam, Dam, Sarkanea, Klaita. Yeah. 
Paldies, Madar. Kleita tieši jām ir sarkana. <laughs> paldies visiem par, par šo konferenci un paldies liels Kamilai par prezentāciju. Tā un noteikti mūsu iedvesmoja tik pat daudz kā Kamila iedvesmoja Johnson un Johnson pieeja. Bet man tas jautājums ir tāds. Nu, ņemot vērā, ka mēs tomēr šeit esam sapulcējušies, lai runātu par to, kā reāli tajai sociālajai uzņēmēji darbībai būt. Un es ceru, ka mans jautājums nebūs rupš, lai gan ir šī stacija un šī sesija par iedvesmu, bet Kamila pastāsts lūdzu par problēmām. Nu, tomēr, ja strādā ar personām, ar īpašām vajadzībām, noteikti kaut kādas problēmas ir un, un kā jūsu organizācija ar tām tie galā. Paldies! Um, so... People with disabilities in our organization are our employees. We would talk in, in these kind of situations as them being beneficiaries, but they're our employees. Um, and we, we, are, we don't walk around with labels saying, I'm a person with a disability and I'm not. It's, it's mostly, we have no idea what probably half the people in the organization, what their disability is. Um, we know what they can do. We focus on what people can do, and sometimes that might be that someone can just make a box. Um, but we, we need a lot of boxes, so there's a great social value there, um, and, and a great business value for us. Um, so yeah, a guy called Alan that makes boxes literally all day, like folds them up and tapes the back of them. He loves his job, he really loves his job, and if he's got this castle of boxes around him at the end of the day, He's pretty happy, and we are too. Um, it is very difficult, um, as I mentioned, about people walking out at Christmas when it's busy. Um, it's really hard with transitional staff um, all the time coming in and out. Um, if work's really difficult. It's really difficult. Um, but I think we all have the right energy to stick to our motivations. Um, we're not going to automate the factory. We're often told that we could just be far more efficient if we just automated the factory, totally missing the point of what we're doing. Um, it's, it's difficult. I'm not going to pretend it's not difficult. On a daily basis, things are difficult. People, uh, there are people without disabilities in the organization, just people that have been in the organization for a really long time, like 30 years, just worked in the organization for a long time. They've never worked anywhere else. So just meeting etiquette of answering emails and writing an agenda for a meeting and uh, accepting the calendar invite and then turning up to the meeting and just the organization is very um, uh, traditional, I guess, in its way of doing things. So people talk and have lots of conversations in the corridors and that's a meeting and, you know, I've got a lot of um, challenges on a day-to-day -day basis, but we are finding that marriage of, of traditional with um, forward thinking, and we're going to get there, um, and we're going to get there by protecting our social mission of 80% of our employees will have disabilities or a long-term health condition. I hope that's answered your question, and you haven't offended me in any way, no worries. <laughs>